believe as we continue our virtual journey around the world. I see the thumbs up and a smile. Very good. Let's see if Antika Colina is here with us. Us. Hello, Antika. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good. We hear and see you very well. Can you hear, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Fantastic. So, where are you right now physically? Where are you coming from? Uh, Zagreb, Croatia. Zagreb, Croatia. Very good. We watched the soccer game a few days ago. That was a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Antika, before we begin, I'd like to uh, also introduce you to our audience so they know a little bit more about you. Um, Antika Kulina, and uh, am I saying that correctly? Kulina? Uh, no, it's Antica. <laughs> Antica? Truly. Yes. Okay, but, uh, Antica Colina. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll try my best. <laughs> so, Antica Colina, she is with the Ruder Boscovich Institute, which is regarded as Croatia's leading scientific institute in the natural and biomedical sciences, as well as marine and environmental research. Antica's work, Antica's, excuse me, work lies on the interface between open science and meta-science and ecology. With this, she strives to enable ecological research to reach its full potential by researching the scientific process itself, understanding and optimizing it. She co-founded SPI Birds Network and Database and Society for Opal, Re Open, Reliable and Transparent Ecology, excuse me, and Evolutionary Biology. Further, she contributes to other open science initiatives such as GoFair Discovery, the UNESCO Open Science, and Research Data Alliance. She currently works as a senior research associate at the Ruder Boscovic Institute in Croatia. Before moving back to Croatia, she did her PhD in evolutionary ecology at the University of Oxford, and then worked as a research on open science in ecology at the Netherlands Institute of Ecology. And I did, of course, some research about you before today's program, and I saw one of the quotes on your university page, which says that, and this is Antisa's quotes, I focus on open science and meta-research in ecology. Why? Because I strive to enable ecologists to do the best possible science with the highest impact on nature and society. I also play piano and advocate for equity, which is a fantastic balance. Good, and Antisa today will be giving her talk, her keynote, which is meta-science and open science for ecology the revolution we need. So, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our digital stage. Antisa, please. Thank you, thank you for the introduction. So, I'll just start with my presentation. Um, <clears throat> I will be mostly, or most of my presentation, really talking about challenges and solutions to these challenges. And this relates to ecological research, so what ecologist tries to address. Um, then, challenges and solutions to open data and fair data in ecology, reproducibility and registration. Most of the examples are for ecological research and are relevant to ecological research, but some of it is kind of of more broader applicability, obviously. Um, so one of the important questions, for example, that ecology is trying to address is climate change. And this is a challenge it has detected quite recently that apart from the global warming we have, we've forgotten to take into account that soil carbon stocks are released because of increased temperature from the soil, which is further increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, thus uh, speeding up uh, global warming. And um, these authors have detected that under different uh, scenarios of climate change, this release is going to be quite drastic uh, and not equally distributed in the world. So now this has shifted up the speed of climate change uh, towards you know, a higher rate. But the solution that ecology is again offering is reforestation, because this is a work that showed the potential capacity of natural forests if we would start replanting them to absorb CO2, because you know that uh, plants do uh, photosynthesis and for that they use CO2. So they could actually absorb a lot of CO2. And as ecologists, this is what we do. We observe our planet, life on it, processes on it, uh, and inevitably, we only observe a snapshot of space and snapshot of time. And based on that, we're trying to solve local and global challenges and just, you know, generally increase our knowledge about the planet that we live on. However, ecological systems, biological systems are extremely complex. Even one individual is complex, let alone if you combine them with populations, community, ecosystems. 
in ecology, you have only high biological natural heterogeneity. And when you study something, very rarely you would explain much of the heterogeneity you are observing with whatever variable you're studying. So you usually explain, you know, 20, 30 percent of variability, which is fine because complex systems are just uh, as such. However, upon that, we also have methodological heterogeneity in which we observe uh, uh, processes and also analytical uh, heterogeneity in the way uh, we analyze the data. So this is another level of heterogeneity we impose on biological heterogeneity. So this gets quite tricky then. But then it gets even trickier because there is another level of a problem. And this brings me back to the story of why I started to work on open science. Um, so for the uh, first chapter of my PhD, I did a meta-analysis. And for that, I had to carefully read a lot of scientific papers for the first time in my life. And reading them, I was quite surprised to see that values, for example, sample size reported in a text did not match sample size reported on a figure. Uh, often information was missing, so there was no sample size of different groups they compared. And related to that, methods were often really unclear. So still to be able to use these studies in my meta-analysis, I wanted to check all the original data, you know, can the authors tell me what was their sample size? For that, I emailed a lot of authors and many emails bounced back, many were not replied. And of those that were replied, uh, more than a half said, I don't know where my data is. And for me, this was a turning point in my career where I realized that the way we do science, the overall system in which the scientific work is embedded is somehow not functioning really well because science or the way we do science is quite far from perfect. And we also lose much of valuable information in it. And then 10 years later, we combine all of these different issues uh, that we have in ecology to calculate something called wasted research. So this is all the research that has been funded, conducted, but there is no value of this research to the end user. And why is this so? So the estimates I'm going to show you come from more than 10,000 studies in ecology, um, where we found that almost half of the work is never ever published, so we never learn about it. This is either low quality work, which is by itself wasted, so it's not published because it's just badly done, and obviously publication bias, but out of published work, almost 70% is poorly planned and poorly conducted. For example, improper use of control group or incorrectly applied analysis. And finally, if you look at result reporting, almost 40% of results in published papers are underreported. So not everything is reported, for example, sample size or the, some measure of uncertainty. And if we combine these in the best case scenario where we have uh, all well-planned research being also well reported, we have 82% of wasted research. And in the worst case scenario, this is 89%. And you know, these are horrible numbers and you know, let them sink in because do we really want to have a system where we have such a huge waste? And this is not uh, isolated to ecology. The only other estimate of research waste comes from medicine where 85 of research is wasted. So interestingly, these numbers are very similar. And I think it's because science, scientific work is embedded in this overall system of publishing, funding, incentives, and so on, that is causing, in part, uh, this huge research race. So now we have a snapshot of information, large biological heterogeneity, methodological heterogeneity, and all of these inefficiencies in the research system. So my question is, how quickly can we actually derive to the truth? How quickly can we detect true effects? Because I do believe eventually science gets to the true effect, but we want this to be sooner rather than later. And this is where I think open science plays a crucial role to um, enable sciences, including ecology, to actually do much better and have much higher value to the society. And I do this by researching science itself, because I'm a scientist, I like to collect data on, on issues and data on whether solutions that we offer are actually effective. And this is called meta science. So I will start with, I think, base of science, which is uh, data that we use to understand things. So in ecology, we have some really cool examples of almost instantaneous data sharing, such as this neon network. 
in the US where they collect different types of ecologically relevant data in a standard way and using standard formats. So this is great, but most of etiological research is not done in this way. Rather, uh, and this is example again from that first study that I presented, where uh, authors wanted to collect uh, data across the world on these uh, carbon stocks changes, and they knew there were thousands of experiments that measured this, but only six reported these changes in a publication. And only two of these had open access data sets, and neither of these data sets provided location info that they needed. So they ended up emailing PIs for the data, and they got you know, in a large enough sample size, but it took them six months just to collect data, let alone to, to standardize and analyze the data. And this is what's called long tail of science or long tail of data. So we have many research groups that are collecting same type of data uh, in slightly different ways, using slightly different formats to store them. And these groups are not connected usually. And overall, it's a huge amount of data that is kind of unused. So we wanted to facilitate the use of open data in ecology. And for that, I collaborated with computer scientists and also a librarian. And this is what I like about open science is truly interdisciplinary effort. So what we did, we basically uh, looked into places that you can use and we call them aggregators to search for data in one interface. So this is equivalent to web of science searching through many journals or journal databases, the same uh, aggregators do for data. They search through many repositories. And we collected these in this resource catalog that you can also access. And some of the resources here are not just for ecological research. So you know, feel free to, to have a look. Maybe it's going to be useful. Um, but obviously, we wanted to see, you know, is this really useful? Can we do um, collect enough data to address some questions in this way? And this particular question on environmental coupling of heritability and selection was a part of FIP's uh, PhD thesis. I'm not going to go into detail of the, this question, but uh, we wanted to collect the data sets that are relevant to answer this. And this graph shows you just that we use all of these different uh, aggregators, as we call them. And in the first row, uh, the first uh, bar, uh, you can see that 18 data sets were detected by six different aggregators. But there were many data sets that were detected by only one. And this is to just show you how difficult it is to detect the data. You have to really put a lot of time effort to find them compared to finding, for example, publications. And this is partly because data sets are badly described, but also partly because infrastructures to discover data are uh, not you know, <laughs> well developed. And later on, actually this year, we published this uh, paper uh, with the GoFair initiative, where we tried to um, give some guidelines on how to improve data discovery. So if you're interested, interested uh, please have a look. But once you find the data, the question is, can we use these open data to uh, address our questions? And in our case, on this environmental coupling, we detected more than 100 relevant open data sets with a quite large taxonomic diversity, which was great. But once we tried to use them, we couldn't because they were of very bad quality. And uh, after we analyzed those data that we could, we also emailed the data authors to check if they agree with the way that we approach data analysis. Because again, every population, every system is specific. So you can approach the analysis wrongly if you don't know the system uh, well enough. And we got these responses. Some people asked us if we wanted more data because they collected more sense. But then we had responses such as, uh, to the students, you were not even born when I started to collect this data. How do you dare to use my uh, well, publicly available, obviously, data set? Our second case study uh, comes from uh, microbial ecology, where we wanted to answer whether these metanotroph communities are struck, how are they structured by their environment? Why do we care about these little guys? Well, because we have methane, which methane, which is the really strong greenhouse gas. And these little bacteria and mic microbes, they are absorbing it from the atmosphere in the process of methane oxidation. And there are only things of methane on Earth, apart from obviously troposphere. Um, but because we have these huge changes in lead use, um, the changes in environment are going to also change these communities and their capacity to absorb methane. 
And to answer this question, we needed, well, metagenome data. And this was great. There were many available in public databases, and we were quite excited about that. But then when we wanted to collect some basic environmental data, which I'm told is always collected with the soil, when you take a soil sample, well, majority of uh, data sets did not have this data available. And even worse, when they did, like in this case of nitrogen, uh, many did not provide units in which they measured the concentration here, 50% almost. So in the end, we could not conduct this study. And I think this shows how sad this is because effort has been put, data have been collected, and then just adding this extra effort to put some additional variables to the database would drastically increase the capacity of these data to be used to answer important ecological questions. So why don't we do this? And this brings me to FAIR data, which I hope most of you have heard about. So basically, these are data that you can find and easily understand and reuse. Uh, and how to transition to FAIR data in a field such as ecology, which is extremely diverse? Well, I'm going to showcase the way that I approach this, and it relates to long-term individual-based studies of animals. So these are studies where animals are tagged with unique numbers, so you can follow them through lifetime, mostly done on uh, mammals and birds. And these studies have be been really essential to what we know about evolution and ecological processes in wild animal populations. Um, so we co I co-founded, uh, I think three or four years ago, the Spy Birds Network and Database, because uh, all of these people collect very similar data in a very similar way, but they use you know, diversity of data management strategy, the way they code variables, vocabularies, the formats in which they store data, whether they do or not quality checks on the data. So if you try to combine data from multiple populations, which we, you know, in today's global ecology need more and more, uh, it's extremely time consuming and sometimes people just give up. And when we wanted to set up this database, we had to talk to you know, our data providers. So what they want, they don't want their long collected data to be open. They do want their data to be used and they do see the benefit of a common format, but they don't have capacity to change their format to any other standard. So they need support. And this is what I've got also from Twitter survey, asking ecologists what's more important for scientific progress, uh, open or fair data, and they said, uh, fair data mostly, but when asked what is easier to achieve, they said it's open data. And I agree because you can open something by putting it in a repository, but to make it fair, you have to put extra effort. And this is what we do for our community. So this is just example from one of the populations where we collect the data from. Uh, so the primary data are collected by the data owner. These primary data are sent to our uh, developers team they create pipelines to standardize and quality check the data. And then uh, we get the data in standard format. This standard format has been agreed within the research community and we attach metadata to this format. So based on metadata, people can come to our website, search for data of interest, request these data. Uh, this always goes to the data owner who has to approve the data use, and they always do with some terms attached. And then we send all the data in a standard format to the end user. And I think, you know, we have to have all of these community, little, uh, little community led efforts in order to standardize at least some part of ecological research. And then we are going to be able to connect ecological research. We have to first obviously map existing efforts with spy birds. We even now, like every week, I learn about the new population that's been done, you know, uh, data collected somewhere in the world. Uh, then we have to standardize the data, both data collection, which can't be done, you know, absolutely, but to a certain extent, and standardized data and metadata formats. And finally, standardized data processing and analysis, again, to a certain extent. And this is what now we're uh, transitioning to with SpyBird. So we are going to, well, we are already creating these uh, standardized pipelines. And this brings me to the second uh, important component of research. And this is uh, code for data processing and data analysis. Uh, I encourage everybody to read this really funny and uh, informative blog by Daniel Bolchnik 
who basically discovered, actually a student discovered post-publication that just this one little bit of code was incorrectly put, which completely changed their results from you know, positive to negative results. And he asks, why don't we review code as a part of the peer review process? But you know, why don't we review it when we are doing a work within our group? Because me too, I always did my coding myself, nobody checked it. And obviously, if you do, you do software development, the code is always checked by another software developer. But why don't we do this in science? Because obviously, this can drastically change our results. And having this code openly available helps understanding the analysis, uh, evaluating conclusions, obviously detecting errors, uh, reusing the code. I myself have reused other others people's code, and that saved me at least some weeks of, uh, of time. And it increases trust in science because it contributes to reproducibility of scientific results. So what does it mean to reproduce? It means that you use the same data and you use the same analysis and you should just get the same results. So that seems easy enough. And we wanted to check how do we stand in ecology. Um, so for this work, we gathered 400 papers randomly from those journals that did have code sharing policy. So either encouraging it or mandating it. And I'll just show you the final result where we detected that in these journals, still 73% of code was not provided with publications. And then some did not have data available, leading to only 21% of ecological literature from journals with code and data sharing policies are being potentially computationally reproducible. But now we are actually trying to reproduce the results. And even with those that have data and code, we can't mostly produce the results. And tomorrow, um, no, I think not tomorrow, but on Friday, I will have a kind of talk. This is follow-up work on this previous study where we looked into whether journal code sharing policies actually increase code availability in ecology. And the final bit uh, of my talk is about registration. Um, by registration, I mean registered reports and pre-registration. And these two share the basic principle. That means that you have the scientific process, uh, you develop the ID, you design your study, and then you either submit it to a journal for a formal peer review process where this work gets accepted or not, and then you continue with your work or you submit it to a registry of studies uh, where you have this kind of timestamp version of what you're going to do. Um, and this should reduce many of the issues down the line, such as questionable research practices, where you know you analyze the data in many different ways to find a significant final result. And what I'm going to show you now is really like from last week, because we are now working on a, a kind of a paper where we try to encourage registration in ecology. And for that, we wanted to collect existing evidence that registered reports and pre-registration are really improving uh, our scientific result and our science. And we searched for meta-studies that compared registered reports or pre-registration with standard literature. And most of these studies come from medicine because registration there exists, I think, since 2000. And this is really basic summary of our results where we looked whether these studies uh, have better methodology and whether they report better. And what we found is that 18 meta studies found that pre registrations have better design, they have a lower risk of bias, they have higher quality of their methods. Um, Four studies, meta studies, detected that they also have better reporting of methods, that they did not look into result reporting, completeness of result reporting per se. And finally, we looked whether results are different between these two. And what studies have detected is that in 15 studies actually found that registered reports and pre-registered studies have smaller effect sizes, they have lower statistical significance, and they are much less often finding results that support hypothesis. And this is what we would expect if registration does reduce questionable research practices. So I think this really works. And in ecology, currently 26 journals that publish ecological research have registered reports, but not many have been published. But pre-registration is like less than 0.01%, I think. 
And why is it so? Well, there are many reasons that you know relate to research culture, but uh, and the, the, the infrastructure. But specific to ecology, I think is because in ecology we have many non-experimental studies, which we argue in our um, you know, new paper that we're writing that should not prevent registration. And a second thing is that we have really diverse systems that we study. So in medicine, research design is much more common across research compared to ecological research. Um, this is work in progress, and we will also touch upon this subject, but also on some other topics uh, of open science in reducing research based in our workshop that happens tomorrow in the afternoon. But I think the registration is already closed. But anyway, who comes, uh, we'll learn more about how these practices can reduce research waste. And I think with that, I'm going to end my talk just in time. Um, with a final remark uh, that while working with researchers in creating open data, I was at the beginning, really, you have to open everything. But with time, I stopped being judgmental because I realized that truly uh, open is not equally open to everyone. So it's not as easy for everyone to make their research open. And fair is also not equally fair to everyone. So cost of making research data fair will vary depending on where you're from, for example. And uh, I think that you know, as people who are interested at supporting open science, we need to build bridges rather than judge. So this uh, photo is from Mostar. It's an old bridge that was destroyed during the war but later rebuild. And I think this is what we need to do as people who are supporting open science, uh, to be kind of there to make this connection between open science and everyday research and everyday researcher. Uh, with that, I would like to <clears throat> obviously thank all of my collaborators that made all the work that I presented possible. And uh, I'm looking forward to the questions, to discussion. And if you have any other thoughts, ideas, whatever, you can always email me or uh, contact me via Twitter. Super. Thank you very much, Antisa. Very, very good presentation, fascinating points. I'd like to open it directly up then to our audience for our slider questions. Again, a reminder to everyone, you can either use the QR code, if we could maybe blend that in there, that's fine. And also an email has been sent out to everyone this morning if they'd like to go ahead and check that to um, open up for the Q&A session. I believe we have one or two questions already ready, so if we can blend in the first one. Um, we have the question, thanks for your interesting and shocking talk. What do you think about the relevance of research assessment in order to cope with the problems you addressed? Yes, I think it's extremely relevant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because um, I think in the current uh, incentive system, well, the ways that research is assessed, we have a disbalance between what is the best for science, and this is getting to the true, and what is best for scientists, which is publish the most paper and never get your paper retracted and never have any of your mistakes found out. Uh, and this is what research assessment is about. And in tomorrow's workshop, uh, we are going to discuss open science practices that can improve research quality, but also the ways in which research assessment and publishing system has to change in order to facilitate true adoption of these practices in a research community. So yeah, I think it's of crucial importance. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Again, a reminder for anyone, the QR code, if you wanna go ahead and put those questions in there or your email. I made some notes also. Maybe if you could just summarize, you'd mentioned it briefly, what role can meta-analysis meta play in evaluating the impact and effectiveness of open science practices in ecology? Just maybe a compact review. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to mention here that meta-analysis is not the same as meta-research. Okay. Usually when you do meta-research, you collect data that then kind of is relevant to broad spectrum of science or part of science, and then you can meta-analyze it. Okay. You know? you're doing some statistical work on it and you want to find what's the overall you know, effect of A on B. Uh, but uh, as I said, I think when you want to support something, you need to evaluate whether this actually works or it doesn't work. So with meta science, first you detect the um, size of the issue. You know, is this really a problem? Uh, in, for example, ecology, is, is it really problematic? Do we really have so much research waste uh, in the research that we've done? So we've proven it. Now we want to see what tools do we have to change this? 
And in order to do so, we need to develop these tools, but also evaluate, do they really work? And are they creating any artifacts that are actually maybe not really uh, favorable? For example, maybe they're creating some other biases. And this is what meta science does. It takes this kind of bird eye view on the issues and then provides you with concrete evidence, which you can then base changes on, which are then informed rather than non-informed mm. by scientific evidence. Okay, good, thank you very much. From our audience, I think we have our next question here. Um, in your experience, is it practical to make data fair? Uh, oh, the question has just been blended out. Maybe if we can get it in there. I'll just wait for a moment. We'll see if our technical issues here. Here we go. In your experience, is it practical to make data fair once a project is completed, or does it require to be designed into data collection from the very start? You can make data fair post hoc, which we do with spy birds, but that's really a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, so it's much more cost effective if you create data management plan where you, you know, think ahead about the data that you're going to collect and how are you going to manage and manage them, which standards are you going to use if there are any standards. And then later, this is really helping you. So I think as much as effort and time you have to put into this first step is going to make your research much easier later on. Um, so I would always say do it before and of course some things might change because when you do your research you realize things that you didn't think about ahead but still uh, that's much easier to incorporate than later on than if you do everything post hoc. Okay super thank you very much. Looking at the clock I think that's all the time we have for our Q&A. I'd like to thank you very much and Tisa Colina I'll give you a virtual round of applause for your presentations, thank you. and thank you also for the excellent questions. Also to our first speaker, Anne, um, I, I do apologize for mispronouncing your last name. I can tell you I asked three different people and I got three different mm -hmm. answers, so I tried my best, and I think in life, as I tell my daughter, that's the best we can do. So to both of our speakers this morning, I do appreciate it, and uh, yes, we're gonna have a lunch break now. Uh, we come back at one o'clock in the afternoon in German time, that's 1,300 hours, or I would say in about 50 minutes, so uh, good evening or good morning, wherever you may be around the world. Here in Germany, it's our lunchtime in Europe, and we'll see you in about 50 minutes to continue. See you soon. Thank you.